Good afternoon, everybody. We're so glad to start our new year. Last year, the uh, State League of Women Voters did a long study on the Oregon coast, on the use of the estuaries, on the um, uh, use by the fishermen, on the, on the drain uh, watersheds feeding into the ocean, and so forth. <laughs> And they have presented us with a wonderful study. And so today, uh, Marnie Lonsdale will be talking to us about the study. Marnie. Okay. Oh, thank you. It, it's not just me. Uh, also with me today is Julie Chapman, who is, was on the study committee. And she's going to take the second half of the show. And I'm going to take the first half, so we'll divide it between us. So that way we'll, we'll both be sharing in this and, and we can perhaps get a little more enthusiastic that way. But we had a fun time doing this study, I have to tell you. And we also discovered that we were valley people and that the coastal people are quite a bit different than we are. And uh, as we looked at natural resources, I'm going to ask you to keep remembering that there is a culture on the coast. And when you make decisions as valley people, it's kind of dangerous that we make decisions without realizing its impact on, on the coast, coastal culture. So the Oregon coastline is about 360 miles long. It, our, our particular territorial sea, Oregon's territorial sea, extends three miles out into the ocean. The actual coastal zone, which we're, we're talking about, goes all the way up to the, the, the crest of the coastal mountains and it extends up the Rogue River a ways and up the Umpqua River a ways and uh, to the end of Puget Island on the Columbia. And that's basically our coastal zone and that's what we're going to be sort of talking about today. I should mention though, if you were to actually measure all the salt water uh, input into our coastal zone, into the streams and into the bays and estuaries, the actual length of it would be more like 1,400. Uh, miles rather than just 360 because we have, of course, a, a very involved coastline. Um, to put it a little more clearly, just so, we have what's called the coastal zone. And the coastal zone on this map, if you see the dark line, solid line, that's the edge of the coastal zone. But where pollution is concerned, they've extended the coastal zone into the coastal non-point pollution zone, which actually takes in the whole of the watersheds of the Rogue and the Umpqua River, because of course those are important rivers and there's a lot of forestry and other activity there. So to protect the, the shoreline, the actual, from the terms of the federals and of our definition, they, that is taken in. So when we talk about pollution, we're talking about a bigger zone than when we talk about the coast in general. So keep that in mind. It's just sort of a, something we kind of jump over it and we want to make sure you're aware of it. Okay, who manages the coast? The coast, amazingly enough, has managers at all levels, all the way from you know, treaties, laws, agencies, regulations, plans at the international, federal, state, and local level. So this one has so many overlapping regulations that sometimes it's very hard to keep track of what's what. At international relation, regu regulations that, that affect the coastal zone, in 1958, the Geneva Conventions were put forward, the laws of the sea, and those are actually, there are four conventions, actually. The, the first one deals with what is the territorial for, of different countries, what it, you know, the rules for the territorial waters of countries, and that, at that point in time, in the international, it extended the territorial waters out to 12 miles. But it also made rules for you know countries that are a little bit closer than that. How, how do you divide that territory between them? It also uh, made rules for what they call innocent passage, so that ships can go through territorial waters without being shot on and things of this sort. So that is all in this, the, the first of the conventions. The second of the conventions deals with the open sea, the, the open waters, that beyond the territorial waters, and the rules for that. The third convention um, deals with fisheries, specifically with fisheries, regulations for fisheries on that whole uh, ocean, and that's the third convention. The final convention that the international laws have put in is deals with uh, what they call the continental shelf. Now that's the underwater shelf that goes off before it drops off into deep ocean. Uh, 
It's very interesting because on the East Coast, our continental shelf is about 200 miles. And on the West Coast, it's more like 40 miles and someplace even less than that. So there are spe specific rules for the continental shelf, of which the most probably one that people discuss the most is, is with regard to mining and going underneath the shelf. And there are rules that give countries rights on that, and that's part of this international convention. Uh, and then in 1982, the United Nations had a, a, a convention on the laws of the sea. U.S. did not ratify that treaty. It is and follows the practices of that treaty, except for some of the minerals in the deep ocean. They don't agree to that. So although we follow it, we did, never did ratify it. And those are the international regulations. Federal regulations uh, tend to involve coastal planning, pollution control, fisheries and wildlife management, refuges and wildernesses. These are the kinds of things that you're going to see in the federal regulations. But of particular importance are some specific ones. The Coastal Zone Management Act of 1972 was a voluntary act. And it was a kind of a clever idea on the part of the government that said, you know, hey, if the states come up with a plan, we'll give them money. And uh, basically now, virtually every coastal state including the Great Lakes states, have plans, and then they get money from the federal government to enforce their plans. So that the deal is, you know, if you meet the requirements, if you have an approved plan, then the federal government's going to give you money to help you address that plan along the coastline. It is a popular program, but, you know, you have to meet the requirements. And I think Julie will mention a little bit about some challenges be where Oregon hasn't necessarily met its requirements. Um, then in 2010, after Obama came into office, he came up with what the National Ocean Policy, and he put out an executive order called Stewardship of the Oceans, Our Coast and the Great Lakes. And this particular uh, policy that he put out was really kind of exciting because he said, and it's in line with what they've been talking about, uh, basically that, that all the different agencies better work together for a change. And the object of this particular guideline was to try to form a group to figure out how they could better work together. And that's sort of there right now, how well it's going to work and how far it's going to go. We just don't really know at this point. Um, regionally, there is a voluntary partnership between the states of Washington, California, and Oregon. Uh, and they do certain things through the Governor's Alliance on Ocean Health. Among the other things that they have done, they have uh, signed off again in, uh, just recently on the fact that there was be no drilling in the territorial waters of the states. They all agreed on that. They passed something and signed off on that. They've also signed off on, on a number of other things. One of the more recent things is with regard to fisheries is the West Coast ground fish trawl share program, which I'll mention again later on, but it was one that all three of the states are cooperating in. They also do a lot of cooperation on the fisheries and work together on that. So this is one of the other ways that the three states are working together right now, because of course, obviously, what affects your neighbor affects you. So now the state has a number of bills, of course, that deal with um, uh, the coast, the beach bill, the planning goals, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And I'm not going to go through talking a lot about them, but they are b basically stressing the uh, issues on the coastline, the quality of life, all those other things. You'll find information on working ports. You'll find information on uh, use of resources. They are in those planning goals, and it's discussed somewhat in the article, and I'm not going to go through them. Also, of course, coming out of the federal government and its Endangered Species Act, Oregon acted and put together the Oregon Plan for Salmon and Watersheds, which also impacts our ocean because, of course, the salmon come out of, go back and forth to the ocean, and so that's part of what we do at the state level. Uh, more specifically, the, in 87 and 91, Oregon Resource Management Act established the Oregon Resource Management Program, which is basically what's called the Ocean Plan. And they established OPAC, or the Ocean Policy Advisory Committee. And you'll see OPAC coming up time and time again in our study. And I should mention, by the way, in the study, there is a list of acronyms, but it's not in the study. It is online. So if somebody in the group wants to go into the league education, they can pull that study. It's one page. And distribute it to everybody. They can fold it up and stick it in, in their 
books so that when they're reading and they can't remember what OPAC stands for, they can look it up. But it is online at the League of Women Vo uh, Voters of Oregon uh, study site. So if you want that just list of acronyms, what do all these things mean? It is there, it's available. We thought about putting it in, but it kind of got a little expensive. So it, it kind of got left out. Um, basically, the Ocean OPAC mandates an ocean resources management plan, the ocean plan, and what they call a territorial sea plan. And those things are required under, uh, under the o total ocean plan. The ocean plan itself defines a whole series of things, and I can basically read them off, everything from a stewardship area, resource conservation, fisheries, marine and bird and mammals, uh, intertidal plants and animals, recreation, cultural resources, anything that you can think of on the coast falls into the ocean plan. So basically, it, it's pretty comprehensive. It pretty well covers everything. Um, it, and that's the ocean plan. The territorial sea plan is really kind of a cool plan because in a certain extent, it's sort of a zoning plan. Uh, it basically looks at the programs that operate within the three mile territory sea of um, Oregon. And you know, I, I should, wait a minute. Yeah, I did mention it. Okay, so I'm all right. Uh, and it looks at everything within that three-mile strip of territorial sea. It was adopted in 1984, and it's been amended several times since. Uh, it, its goal is really to protect our ocean. It's to conserve the values and the natural resources. And one of the things that it did was recognize the need for the fact that, you know, just like you have a zoning plan for your city, we need a spatial map of our ocean. And to do that, you know, kind of take a look at it here. If you look, this is... This is our ocean. At this end, we have three miles. At the other end there, we have basically the vegetation line. So you have this run from the ocean to the vegetation line. Uh, state waters begin here. Basically, uh, you have the different levels up there. And I should mention our Beach Act, which originally actually started in 1913 when, um, uh, I can't think of who was, West, West was it? West. Yeah, well, Governor West and then they, declared the, the uh, beach below the, the uh, high water mark as open space for a road. Because at that point, the coast didn't have roads, and therefore, they, they, everybody had access to it because of that. In the 67, when the Beach Act came into effect, it took it one step further and actually took the public recreational uses, gave them a, a, a um, access and a priority to use it, all the way up to what they called the vegetation line. So basically, our beaches are open to the public because of those two things that were done in the past, which is unique because up if we go north into Washington, they don't have that. The beaches are belong to the people. You can't, you know, basically, they don't have that. We do. And that's one of the wonderful things that has been done to protect it and make the coast dearer to all of us, actually. But this is basically the area we're talking about in the territorial, uh, in, in the um, yeah, territorial sea map planning. And the map is coming along. And this is an example of the map. And this is on the northern coast. Uh, and I'm not going to explain through it, but it shows you a whole bunch of different things from a, from a proposed renewable energy site, which is right there in the blue. And it shows you all sorts of different components that are along that shore. And ultimately, when it's finished, we're going to pretty well know, well, you can't you know, put that there because of. And it, everything from the fact that, oh, that's a, a breeding site for this bird, or, oh, that's where the crabs are, or, and basically this map is going to tell us about all these different places. So when we make decisions on the ocean, we're going to know, just like we do on land, what, what, you know, what should be zoned. And this is what the plan is, and they have been working on this. And, and if you go online to, and it's, So oregon.marinemap.org. I think that's in your study. But if you go online to that site, you can actually register, sign yourself up. All you got to do is sign your name. They send you and to get you in. And you can make your own maps. You can say, oh, I want to see where the birds are. Or I want to see where the fish. And if the map has been done, you can actually take a look at where those different things are on the coastline. So that's one of the cool things that's coming out of this. And, and that's the basically the territorial sea planning. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot more about too many regulations. On a local level, we have comprehensive plans and land use ordinances. And it might, you know, 
we didn't really understand the geology of the coast too well until very, very recently. And because of that, uh, earlier development plans and other things didn't really take into effect the geology. So it's only in very recent years that we're beginning to understand the geological role and, you know, well, you better not build there because. And because of that, we have a lot of stuff that was built before there was a rule. And then we have stuff that's being built after, and you have the conflict. Well, he did it, you know, why can't I? And how do we deal with this? So, so the coastal communities are facing challenges of, of dealing with this right now, and they don't have a lot of money. So those things have to be considered when we come down on them from our kind of valley view and, and look at that kind of thing. Uh, one of the cool things about all of this is that the federal regulations in the Territorial Sea Plan require that we're consistent. So if there's a conflict, it, it comes all the way down to the local community say. It doesn't, you don't get dictated on. It has to, it has to take the look up and down the ladder. So that's important too. Okay, now coastal characteristics, the environment of the coast. This is a really cool area. It has basalt, mudstone, sandstone, mountains, beaches, sand dunes, a really exciting geological history that you know is worth studying in and of itself. It's seismically active. We are in the Cas oh, Cascadia subduction zone. And literally what that means is the plate off the land is going over the plate on the ocean, basically like this, so that the, the ocean plate is going underneath and the other plate is rising up. This means that we have land rising and the other one moving underneath. And as it gets into the next point, the sea level rising, one of the interesting things is part of the coast, the sea level is rising faster than the land is rising. Another part of the coast, the land is rising faster than the sea level. So we have some very peculiar things going on on the coastline. So if you start to talk about climate change and sea level rise, it's going to have different impacts on different parts of our coastline because different things are going on. Um, obviously, our coast is a habitat for many species. It also has a lot of migratory routes for everything from whales to birds. It is an important area for that. And it, and it has a tremendous number of important ecological areas. And one of my favorites, of course, and, and one of the unique things to coastlines is estuaries. And estuaries are unique in the fact that they're both salt and fresh. They're a tidal zone. The salt water comes in, salt water goes out, and fresh water comes in and out. Uh, when the rivers are down in the winter season, when there's no flow, no melt, then the salt water goes further up. When the melt comes in the summer, the, the fresh water goes further down. So they're this really mixing zone and very, very important to sea life because they become the nursery for a tremendous amount of our sea life. That's where they go. It's safer. It, it's not that. And from a human standpoint, estuaries are really great at stopping floods. The estuary, the water spreads on the estuary. You can see that in the picture. This is out of Florence. In, in particular in this picture, but when, they, when the water comes in, the estuary spread, they, the water spreads out there, it doesn't go in, you don't have the flooding damage, so they're very, very protective. Uh, they're exciting in, in so many different ways. Uh, and we have 22 major ones in uh, Oregon, and of course we do have one national, uh, and I get my title right on it, and of course I don't have the things in front of me, but the National Research Estuary uh, South Slough out of Coos Bay, and this was the first national, or first or second national research estuary, came in in 1977, and it is where a lot of the research on the West Coast estuaries is being done. It's very important. It is growing. They're acquiring more land as they go along. It's a place to visit. It's a wonderful education experience, and it is really where we're getting a lot of the answers on estuaries, everything from how they work to how we can restore them. So that's one place that it's worth, if you get a chance to, to go visit and, and see that. Ah, uh, but estuaries also happen to be a lovely place to put a port. So over the years, estuaries have been cleaned out, grasses, and, and they have been turned into harbors. This is, this is human development. Estuaries are the perfect place for harbors. So you have a war going on between human development and preserving the estuary, and this continues to go on. But you need the ports too. You need you know, people to have access. You need all of those kinds of things. So it, it, it's a constant, you know, 
issue, how do we balance the two out? But estuaries, because of human development, they get built in. And then, of course, beyond the port, there are people that just want to put a dock right out in the estuary, you know, so they can walk way out to the water. And, and in an estuary which rises and falls, that dock has, that, you know, that pier has to be a ways out there. So you have all of these things going on. They're also endangered during rising sea levels. If the sea level rises, the salt water goes farther up, the estuary, in, in actual fact, would have to go upstream. Now, if you looked at our coastline, it goes pretty high up, so that becomes challenging in itself. So we may run a risk of losing estuaries if sea level rises and not being able to place them because we don't have a place for them. They are also impacted by ocean acidification, which if you've got another day, we can go through in detail. But many of the estuary th uh, uh, organisms are dependent on, for example, the oyster's an easy one to pick on the oyster. The, the small oyster has only a very short period of time to initiate putting on a shell. If the water coming in from the ocean is too, too acid, no shell, no oyster. And they have found in some of, the, some of the estuaries and on up the river that they actually, even on the oyster farms, that they have to adjust the water so that their oysters can set the shells. And it is that much of a fact. And what happens is that the bottom of the ocean is actually right now is more acidic. It's coming down. And when, that, when you have an upwelling and that bottom water comes into the bays, it makes the, the, the uh, water there more acidic. And that has a tremendous effect on the organisms that live in this area. So this is one of the things we're seeing now. And interestingly enough, I'm not right. The, the acidic water that's coming in is, what, 50 years old? It's, it's, it's been down at the bottom of the ocean for 50 years and traveled down here and now it's coming up. So you hate to think about this stuff that's going down to the bottom of the ocean now, how acidic it's going to be you know, in 100 years time and what's going to happen at that point. But that's one of the things that's going on. Um, the other side of the issue is cost of the restore an estuary. If it's been gone for too long, you actually change the, the bottom, it's no longer the materials that were there to support the grasses and things that are in estuary. So restoration is very challenging because, well, if, if, if the structure of the area is, clean, if, you know, have the sands have been washed out, if other things have come in, you can't go back and just plant the grasses and expect it to be happy. You can't put things back because it's all changed. So they're really doing a lot of research on it. How do we restore them? How, you know, and what are their functions and that? So a lot's going on. It's a cool area to look at, and there's some really neat stories out there. But as I mentioned, this is an old economy. It's a cultural economy. It, and it is uh, the people there historically have depended on natural resources for their economy. So when we look at natural resources and take positions, keep in mind that there's a whole economy that was dependent on this. But what we know about the coast now is it's getting old. And uh, you know, the group in here is familiar with that. But what, what has happened is that it, it's become a you know, retirement community. It, it, people go there when they're older and almost half of the income, maybe even over half of the income, and it's in, in your study, uh, on the coastline is coming from investments Social Security and things like that. So they are dependent on this kind of thing uh, for economy. And the other thing to keep in mind about this older economy is the older we get, the more services we want. So there's a huge demand for services. But uh, going just a little bit air further, a limited area for development, only about 15% of the coastline is developable. And uh, so there's a very limited area where you can put anything. And of course, you've got agriculture in there. You've got other things in there as well. So you, you have this conflict, and we don't pay our service people very well. Cost of housing is high because of the demand by the tourists. So what you have is you, you, you need somebody to do those simple jobs. There's no place for them to live. So there's these real challenges going on right now. And then the young people out there, the scientists and things that are going out, because this is a new culture coming out there, told us when we were out there visiting that they have challenges too because of a husband and wife team that have got their PhDs and have gone out to Hatfield or down the coast and they're doing research or they're with the um, you know, with NOAA or something like that, and they go out to the coastline. They don't have things out there like um, um, preschools or, or babysitting services for kids. And if husband gets a job as a scientist, wife who has equivalent advanced degrees goes out there and can't find a job because of this. So there's some real interesting economic conflicts on the coast that we wouldn't think about. Uh, the natural resources of the coast 
fisheries and forestry are still about 15% of the income and to those that have lived out there and to the young of the coast, young people that want to stay on the coast, those natural resource industries are very important. So there is that strong, if we want to live out here, we want those industries. Um, it's of course obviously a tourist attraction and one of the conflicts you have is that tourists don't want certain things. When we talk about wave energy later on, you know, people don't want to look at at things floating in the ocean or something like that. So you have conflicts that are coming up that way too. But, and I cannot deny, and, and we can't ignore the fact that the, the ports of the coast are important. Coos Bay, for many years, was the number one lumber exporting port in the country and like fifth or sixth in the world. So basically these ports have been important over time as, as tools and export for us as access to the coast and we were you know really lucky in the fact that we were able to get NOAA into Newport recently so now we're becoming a, a science access and of course the appeal of new, bringing NOAA to Newport as opposed to NOAA up in the Seattle area is that you can go out of Newport Harbor and you're in the ocean and in Seattle you had to go all the way through the Puget Sound and so it was eight or nine hours before they could even get to the ocean so the appeal of coming down here is that access to the ocean so that's to keep in mind too. Okay, fisheries. One of my favorite ones, the tradition, this is a very traditional Oregon industry, salmon, bottom fish, uh, crab, shrimp, clams, oyster, crab being very big, oysters being very big, um, salmon of course, so we have a lot of different fisheries. We have commercial fisheries, we have sports fisheries, very popular tourist activity, not just to do it, but to be able to walk along the dock and see the fishermen doing what they're doing. Um, there is a huge international demand for fish protein, which continues to grow. And I, you know, I hate to admit, having grown up in the Midwest and as a kid, you know, the, the, we didn't eat fish, you know, the, the Catholic families had fish on Friday, but the rest of us didn't, you didn't have to have it. And now there's nothing I would really like better, but this is a very change in our culture that fish has become very important. Um, we have a little bit of fish farming in Oregon, but it's oysters and hatcheries. And the thought is that it probably will not grow beyond that. That's the current feeling. I can't really say to the future, but that's it. And the other thing about all of this fisheries, it's very heavily reg regulated both at the state and the federal level. But I can't, you know, go away from fisheries without mentioning the fact that fish are in a drastic decline, absolutely drastic decline. If you look at this and look at it, you, you basically see fully harvested. I mean, basically they're there, there might be a few out there, but there aren't very many left. Atlantic salmon is an example. You, you, there are some out there, and a, 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 you know, a basic recreational fisherman might catch one here and there, but virtually if you're gonna get Atlantic salmon, you're probably gonna get farm salmon because it just isn't there anymore. Cod is in some sort of a stress too. Of course, the bluefin tuna, you hear about those. They are really under the, under the wire. Um, Swordfish is kind of iffy, marlin, some of the other ones. They, they are really overfished to the point of really being overharvested, basically fully harvested. Uh, there's a tremendous amount too, you, as you can see, moderately, over, moder moderately overfished. Uh, some are recovering. So really what, what's happening is our, our fish are in trouble out there. They have problems. We, you, we may actually, whether we like it or not, be eating farmed fish at one point because there won't be any others to eat. And that's, you know, kind of, maybe that's the answer actually to protecting the wild ones is to come up with good farming methods, I don't know. Uh, Oregon fisheries, there are eight species of ground fish. They are listed in your, in the pamphlet, the, the ones, these are the rockfish. The classic, what they used to call the Pacific red snapper rockfish is one of them that, that is overfished and, and has been declared overfished. Um, Remediation plans are in process for all of these overfish species. There are limits on them, and, and this is what this West Coast uh, trawl, groundfish trawl fisheries share program, which was introduced in 2011, is about. And what they're doing, actually, is they have, for Washington, Oregon, and California, they have set up a shares program. The commercial fisherman goes in, he's given a share of this particular species. You can catch so many pounds. And that's his share. If he goes out and catches more than his share, he's got to trade with somebody else or come up with an answer or he pays a fine. 
The result of this is you don't have the situation, well, I caught too many, there wasn't anything I could do about it because he can't do that anymore. And the result of this, and there's a very nice report that was just put out that shows that last year the bycatch has gone down tremendously and the actual catches have gone up. So this is effective. This is not new to Alaska. Alaska does this. The East Coast already does this. We just have been introduced to it, and hopefully this is going to help our ground fish, a lot of those are the fish that this deals with, so that we won't have, we will be able to get them back up and, and start to do better with that. Also, our fishery is another thing that they're doing positively. The Marine Stewardship Council certified sustainable fisheries. And you go into Walmart, you go into New Seasons, you go into any of these, you will see these little labels on the fish. And what these are is the, that particular fishery has gone through a series of uh, procedures to make them a sustainable fishery. For example, crab, and that's one of our sustainable here. And what, what they do with the crab now, they have the, the traps that they use have certain uh, sizes on them. They have certain things that if you lose a trap, it's going to fall apart so that fish aren't caught in it. There's a whole bunch of different standards that they use to make sure that the um, uh, fish don't get overfished. And basically, and they have a bunch of standards. The pink shrimp fishery, one of the cool things that they've done in that is it, they've put grates in the, it's, it's a, they pull a long net along, there's a grate in the net, and the bigger fish can't get through the grate. There's a little hole next to the grate, and so the bigger fish go out the side. When they first started to try this, fishermen were very skeptical, and they, they took some video cameras down there. We were told by Hatfield about this, and they took some pictures of the fish going in, and then the fish swimming out, and the shrimp going through. And the fishermen got so fascinated with it that eventually they were competing with each other who could produce the best video. But they bought into it, and they have a sustainable pink shrimp fishery because of that. Uh, the Pacific albacore has also been declared sustainable, and the Pacific heck midwinter trawl and North Pacific, all of these have gone through certain standards. They're doing things. The fishermen are doing a lot. They are under a lot of pressure. There are a lot of laws that they face. There's a whole list in the report of the different things that they're facing. And I asked a fisherman, I said, well, are the fish going to be here in 50 years? And he said he thought so, but if they weren't, he said, it won't be the Oregon fishermen's fault because we have all these regulations and we follow them. So when you think about those things, just keep that in mind a little bit as you go along. Um, but now, how do we get the fish back up? And one of the things that's come up is marine reserves in protected areas. And marine reserves are ocean areas that, that are fully protected from activities that, that remove animals. They're totally protected. Uh, marine protected areas, there's a limited amount of things allowed. For example, if you have a, 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 an area that's protected but it has a sandy patch in it where the, uh, where the crabs are, they might allow the, the, them to put their pots down and collect crab, but they won't, they won't allow any other kinds. So in a protected area, there's certain things you're allowed to do so it isn't completely off limits, but in a reserve, it's off limits. Um, okay. The argument for marine reserves, the one they used to live is the, they used to talk, they talk about the boof. Uh, what they see in these reserves is that, that increases in plants and animals, size, diversity, and the example of this is the big, old, fat, fertile female fish. And she produces a lot more little fish. So the marine reserve provide a place for her to live so she can get old and fat and reproduce like crazy. And that's one of the arguments about marine reserves. It's something that's showing up in them. So uh, when thinking about reserves, you want design. You want them to be located in an area that has the habitats that you want. So if you want a kelp bed, you want your reserve where there's kelp. Uh, you want to have boundaries that you can enforce. You want it to be large enough to do any good. I mean, if we have a reserve the size of this room, chances are it's not going to have any effect. So you have to have a certain size, and of course, the larger the better, but you know you also have to think about other activities. You want uh, a series of reserves with, with distance between them, but not too much distance, so the fish that like to migrate can bop from one reserve to another and, and still chance, chance of survival. So, that's the kind of thing that you want in reserves. You have to conceive, uh, you consider things like, well, if you have a reserve, the fishermen lose a fishing ground. If that reserve is close to home, 
he has to go beyond that, which means his gas costs go up, his fuel costs, his, his, you know, the weather has to be better because he's out there longer and all of those kinds of things. So it, it's sort of hard on the fish or fishermen. Uh, as I mentioned, the fishing costs, uh, but on the other hand, there are certain benefits. Uh, you have to take a look at uh, the recreational activities that you can get by having a reserve. So these, these kinds of things that replace the fishermen. You have to look at, reserves don't do any good unless there's monitoring. And you have to look at how you enforce them. Who's going to be out there making sure that that fisherman didn't go into the reserve? And much of that, by the way, is done because the fishermen enforce themselves. You know, how dare he go in, I'm going to report him, basically. You know, they, they don't want anybody in the reserve, and, and they do enforce it themselves. That's what they found elsewhere. Now, in Oregon, process started in 2002, uh, and in 2008, there was an executive order that called for nine, nine or fewer sites. 20 proposals were submitted, and then there was a lot of community involvement, meeting after meeting after meeting on the coastline. And as a result of that, first of all, they set up two preliminary areas at Redfish Rocks and Otter Rocks were the two original ones that came into effect. Those now have gone through their preliminary testing, that, you know, and when the preliminary testing, and now they are actually fully protected and ready to go. And then in just this year in 2012, Cape Perpetua, Cascade Head, and Cape Falcon were added. Now you can see that the, the only problem we have is there's a, a gap. And this is because at the present time, Cape Argo is, is, is the, Argo, Argo? Is, is the one other area that they've looked at, but at this point they haven't been able to come up with an agreed plan. So that one is out. But, but these five are in there, the, the ones in blue, the second three now they're doing the preliminary testing, setting up the monitoring, and it'll take about two years before they are fully protected. So that's where we are right now. The, the bill was signed in May of this year, so the marine reserves are in now. So the big issues then become how do we make sure that they work, how do we collect data, and, and by the way, this costs a lot of money. So the next step now is to collect the data, and the kinds of things that they're going to be looking for, oceanographic conditions in the area, the habitats, uh, what's there, and the a presence in the distribution of species, and what they will be doing is they will pick an outside of the area to monitor and an inside the area. So they will be actually, you know, putting one against the other to see whether these areas actually are better. But before we'll know whether it's working, it's got to be supported to get research and other things done. So that is really the next step. And with that, Julie, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about ocean energy. So um, moving into ocean energy, which is the next uh, sort of big and newish. Um, can you hear me? Uh, speak. Uh, so it's the next um, kind of newish concept to be applied to the coast. Um, there are several kinds of ocean energy, and the one we're actually going to spend the most time on is wave energy. Um, the reason that the state is putting resources into this is because it has voted into law in 2007 that the three largest utilities in the state had to come up with 25 percent of their retail energy electricity coming from renewables. And so um, there, there was a push on then to find if there were other things besides the wind and the solar that already exist in the state that would allow them to, to um, accumulate more energy from another renewable source. We actually do not in this state have anything to do with thermal or tidal um, power because the thermal requires kind of a, a um, more um, tropical environment to work and you have to have big differences between the, the warmer top and the cooler bottom. And the tidal energy requires a huge increase in the tidal flow, which we really don't have in closed areas where this comes through. Wind technology is actually cheaper to put on land than it is to put in the ocean, so there hasn't been a big push yet to put that in the ocean. Um, so the advantages of uh, wave energy, in particularly in compared to uh, wind energy, is that the availability is high. Uh, there's lower vari variability between times when you get waves and times you don't get waves. 
Um, the forecastability is really important because you can actually look out into the ocean and you could, the, the waves come and they don't really change all that much as they come over 100 miles to the shore. And so you can look at that and say what's going to happen up to 48 hours afterwards in terms of where there will be rises and how much impact it's going to have. And that's important because when you feed electricity in the grid, you have to have some predictability about it or you overwhelm the grid. And so you, it's really helpful to know how much you're going to be feeding in at any point during the, the next 48 hours. Um, so they have, with WaveWatch, which is an existing um, NOAA station, they can actually get um, reliability up to within 15% of um, error, and that's a, a really helpful uh, piece for them to use. Um, wave energy off Oregon is, is varies with the season, and it's actually really helpful for Oregon because, of course, the waves are bigger and more forceful during the wintertime. That's when they need heating at the coast. That's when they use electricity more. And in the summertime, nobody air conditions at the coast, uh, more or less. And so the, the waves being smaller in stature really feeds in well to that pattern of use. So we're going to go over some technologies, different technologies, um, of the way that they capture the energy from the waves. Um, there are a lot of varieties of designs. Um, few of them have actually been ocean tested. Uh, they're all pretty expensive to produce and to test and to connect to the electrical grid. The UK is probably the, one of the biggest um, experimenters in uh, developing ocean energy. Um, and they have some prototypical devices in the water, nothing that's commercial scale and nothing that's connected to a grid. Um, Oregon has um, a research center at uh, OSU that is developing the um, looking for the technical, environmental, and social challenges of wave and tidal energy. It's in conjunction with another center up at UW, and um, they do some of the, um, they provide some facilities to do standardization so you can look at new prototypes that you've put in the ocean and see what impacts they have um, and what, uh, what energy they produce as they're in operation. Um, there are a couple things that are going to be going in immediately. Um, actually, there is a, a, uh, a small device that has been put into the water about two weeks ago um, at Yakuna Head that went in late August 2012. And uh, they're going to take it out again after about five more weeks. Actually, it's only three more weeks now. Um, and the scientists from OSU are monitoring the acoustic, uh, what's the sound impact of this, the electromagnetic frequencies, the impact on sea life, uh, whether they're the bottom dwellers or the migrating whales. And, um, and then they have a device that's in the water that's called the Ocean Sentinel that actually measures uh, the strength of the wind, the strength of the waves, how much, um, what's happening with the current, and how much is the power buoy actually producing in terms of energy that it's able to capture. So um, a second one that is actually going to go in the water, <laughs> we'll talk more about this one later, but uh, getting into sort of the technology of how these designs work. Um, this one is called a point absorber, and the the machine is consists of this floating section right here, and it consists of, this one shows a buoy, but actually the one that's going into Oregon has a big metal circle that sort of anchors it to the bottom of the, the ocean. And the, the buoy, of course, rides up and down as the waves come, and its motion of this little collared area, that, that center yellow part, up and down that skinny little pole that's called a spar, is what creates the, um, the energy production. Um, it's, it's called uh, rack and pinion, which you may have heard about from a car. It's a pretty simple mechanical design. They designed it so it wouldn't have hydraulic fluid in it. That it's sort of an update from an earlier version that they had produced. Um, and it's to, because they don't want anything to happen in terms of spills. So they're being pretty cautious about how they produce these with the, the, the idea of having a uh, least impact possible um, environmentally. And this one is going to go off the coast of Reedsport Gardner area. And um, the one that they're actually going to put in, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a later slide. This one is a different design. Um, this is called an oscillating water column. Um, 
there is a column of air that exists above the, um, the level of the ocean. So this all up in here is air. And it funnels the water. When a wave come, it comes, it funnels the water. So it fills up this bottom, um, this bottom part of the device, which raises the water up in here, which then pushes the air out through that top part. And it, that movement of the air in and then out again, where it kind of goes up and down, is also the part that then creates the electrical um, energy trapping. This is an overtopping device. Um, it allows the water to come up over the top here into a reservoir area. And then when the water then comes back out again, the water, this water falls in through this trap. And that energy through here is, is then, um, what would you call it, captured um, to create electricity again. And this is an attenuator. I like these a lot. Um, these actually lie on the surface of the ocean. You can see that they're, they may not be all that visible from land once they get away from the shore. Um, they're, they're also called snakes, I think. And what happens with these is that you align them, uh, one end of it at least is tethered, and you align them with the, the direction of the waves as they come into the shore, so that as the wave comes in, it moves those pieces, they're, they're jointed pieces, and it's in the joint that the electricity is created. The power is, is then generated. And then this is um, Aquamarine's oyster. It is, um, they were really active in the area of Newport until probably six or 10 months ago and were wanting to put an oyster in the water near there. Um, they operate by being fairly near to shore. Um, the wave, comes in and causes the, the top part to come up and come down again, which pushes a column of water through a large uh, tube that goes to shore and is generating, is moving a generator on shore and then is returned back into the ocean again. And um, so you can see from the devices that we've looked at, they're all quite different. Some of them are under the water totally. Some of them lie right on the surface and some of them protrude above the level of the, of the above sea level. And they can be near shore, um, in the near shore area. They can be um, way offshore. And the, the systems are vary from mechanical to electromagnetic to hydraulic. And so there, there's just a lot of different experimentations going on right now to try to determine the most effective method of capturing the energy. So one of the concerns that we have about um, wave energy devices is that um, you, have, you obviously have some energy that's actually being uh, captured by the device as the wave moves to the shore. And when you think about one you know, little lone device out there in the water, it doesn't seem like that would have much impact. But they talk about when they're really getting into production, they need to be putting in 10 or more of these, uh, kind of making a little farm of these uh, machines. And it could um, capture enough energy from those waves to change the, di the dynamics of how the water moves onto the shore and how it deposits the, um, the sand in the shore, how it moves it around. And it could have some impact on the, um, the, the structures themselves being really tall or, and down into the water. So the tallness of it may impact birds uh, if they're lighting on, those, um, on the, the actual device. Um, and then it's this hard um, machine that's, that is uh, tethered to the bottom in many cases, which is going to change the bottom area, and it's going to make a structure kind of like an artificial reef, which could be good, it could be bad, it may have electromagnetic forces coming off, it may have... So there's a lot of different environmental impact things that people are paying a lot of attention to and monitoring right now. Um, and they may not look real pretty. I mean, that's the other thing that, that has been a discussion all, all along the course of trying to make some decisions about how to, you know, how to put these things in the water off of the Oregon coast. So uh, the other concerns about wave energy is, is it competitive? Well, we're in the very early stage of development of, of the wave energy industry. And uh, it's expensive. It's tremendously expensive. Um, the technology is still not perfectly refined. Most of it hasn't been 
um, and none of it has been hooked up to the grid yet. So we haven't really come to a point where we're, um, we're producing anything out of this. So this kind of in the research and development phase, which is always extremely expensive. And people sort of weigh it out against the wind energy and the solar power, which are pretty mature systems of gathering renewable energy and trying to figure out, well, is it worth it to spend the money to, to put these things into the, the coastline? Um, when you have these devices in the water, it's likely that you're not going to be allowing the, the fishing boats to come through that area. It also is competing for the sandy bottom because many of these devices want to be over an area that's pretty fat, flat and sandy. And so those are pretty prime areas for um, the crab fishermen. And the Dungeness crab people are really paying very close attention to whether this is going to impact their livelihood in terms of where they're placed. Um, that we still don't know about you know, how it's going to work exactly in connecting to the grid. The interesting thing about the grid in Oregon is that in the old, old days, uh, not that long ago, when logging was huge on the coast, they had built a lot of capacity into those stations along the coast because they were providing the energy for the lumber mills that were all along those areas. Well, as lumber has, has gone out of um, production, there's a lot of capacity in those stations along the coast, which can then do the intake of the energy from, from the uh, devices that are in the water. So it, in some ways, it's a very good match, again, for the coastal communities that are, um, already have these infrastructure set up there. Um, and again, it's technologies in the early development. And one of the statements that, um, one, of the, one of the things was that, uh, that it would produce electricity that costs 15 cents per kilowatt hour uh, someday, which is twice the cost that we pay today. And that's, that's an important structure because you're going to have to get into these really large farm um, device developments in order to get up to it, to get the advantages of um, a large scale production that then starts to allow it to be less expensive. And then public involvement has actually been very robust um, in terms of how to place these, where to place them. There have been the Territorial Sea Plan Working Group, which is the one that's doing the mapping of the coast, has been meeting all up the coast in just almost every single community um, up and down the coast on multiple, multiple occasions to get input from the people from the coastal communities. In addition, they, they did a, an extensive mapping, which we showed a little bit of, but they, they did mapping of where all the fishing is, activity is taking place. And the fishermen actually came in and in a very um, private and secret um, manner gave all of their fishing information to Ecotrust, which then made it these maps that were confidential and that just pooled all of the information as opposed to showing where Joe went fishing. And so they were able to put those fishing maps with high priority and kind of second level and not so high, which as you might imagine on the coast takes up a whole lot of the coast. So there has been a, a lot of pushback from uh, both the fishing industry as well as from um, the, the communities as a whole about what impact this will have on livelihoods and on our enjoyment of going out to the coast. Um, this is a really dry part. I'm going to go through it really quickly because we don't have much time. Um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission actually takes the lead role in um, allowing uh, sites to be developed um, along the coastal areas of the United States. Um, Oregon and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, signed an agreement, um, and the agreement essentially, let me go back one step. So in 2007, all of these different energy industries said, we'd like a little piece of your coast, and they, they put in proposals for areas along the coast and kind of did what they call site banking, where they said, we'd like to develop in this area right here off of um, Florence, let's say. And, um, and so they, they kind of put their, put their stamp on it that said, this is going to be mine if I develop it. Well, Oregon got very nervous at that point, um, many of the people in Oregon, because they really didn't want to have this sort of helter-skelter development of all of these different facilities all up and down the coast. and so. Um, Oregon and the, the FERC got together and did a, an MOU, uh, which is the Memorandum of Understanding, and they um, agreed that when Oregon co completes its comprehensive plan, which is in process right now, for the siting of wave energy projects, FERC agreed that, to consider whether the projects were consistent with the plan. So they're, they're, um, 
they have some sites that of course are being developed right now as we've talked about, but in terms of the future, they're going to be having input from the Oregon Territorial Sea Plan um, amendment that's going to eventually, <laughs> it's been being worked on for the last two plus years, and eventually there'll be a, a recommendation for where is the best place along the coast, wh what can we allow people to develop in. The Territorial Sea Plan is really um, an important sort of overview of this because um, it has some guiding principles um, and among the principles are the the protection of marine resources. It's built right in the plan. So when you talk about um, the natural environment, when you talk about all of the, the living creatures in the ocean, when you talk about the industries, and, and uh, well, let's just start with that. So that those are protected. Uh, you've got you've to gotta look at the sustainability of those uh, living creatures and that environmental piece uh, when you're thinking about doing anything to it. Um, the other piece is that if you've got infrastructure already where you've got cables coming in, you know, the transatlantic cables come across and get connected. There are, there's fishing industry, obviously. Um, there are um, shipping zones where if people, are, you know, where they're actually mapped out where people, the, the large vessels can go through our, our seas. Um, and when they look at all that, they have to protect those uses when they're considering adding a separate use. So right now, um, it's kind of interesting because um, the Ocean Power Technologies, uh, the, the Ocean Power Technologies is planning to put this buoy off of uh, Reedsport. The date for that has been changed about, oh, I'd say over the course of at least a year. It's kind of moving back and moving back, but it's in the process of being produced. The actual, the actual device itself is being produced and um, it will be floated out um, off of Reed's Port, about two and a half miles off of Reed's Port within a territorial water. This device um, is underwater about 100 feet. It goes down to, the, to the, shore, the, the base of the ocean about 100 feet and it sticks 30 feet up. Uh, actually, it sticks a different amount depending on how much the waves are going up and down. And then that, the whole base of that is about 40 feet across. And this is kind of the, the pro, it's a prototypical model. Um, it weighs 200 tons. I thought that was <laughs> amazing. They have a similar device off of Scotland produced by the same company. Um, and it was actually redesigned to take out the hydraulic fluid. It, it's a mechanical only device that, that is gonna be put off of Oregon. It won't be con connected to the grid for the first year, but it's actually a, a grid, uh, energy production model. It's not just a prototype to see if it won't fall over. It's a prototype that will um, go into actual production after about a year or two. And at that time, they're going to move nine more of these out with it. It's buddies, and it will be a little park together. And they will have these uh, cables that will come into shore to bring the energy into the grid right around Gardner, right near Reedsport. So, um, once they have the nine more models, they'll, they'll have, you know, and this will probably happen much more slowly than anyone has ever suspected because these things take forever to build. The first one, of course, is the hardest, but um, it, once they get them in position, it would be able to uh, power up about a thousand homes with all of the, the, um, the 10 of them that are in that area. If this goes well, um, with this first year with the prototype model, they're going to, um, the OPT, the company, is going to also start thinking about developing a park off of Coos Bay. And so that's been a, um, uh, they have a permit to use an area off the coast there, and it kind of depends on how well this goes here. I don't know if you all remember, but um, I think it was 2007, they stuck a device um, off of Reedsport again, I think, wasn't it? And it w did really well for two months, and it did just what you expected it to do, and then it, fell, it <laughs> took on water and it fell over. So that's been our one experience so far with um, the magic of wave energy. We're moving along. Um, so this is a separate topic that has to do with invasive species. Um, and you probably are somewhat aware of invasive species. They, they have a lot to do with what is brought into your area from another, whether it's on purpose uh, for something that was really thought to be a beautiful plant that now is taking over 
um, from all of the native species, or it was a lot of times it's dumped out of um, fishing holds as the ballast water is is taken out of the, the ship. Um, it, let me give you a couple examples. So these are two things that are happening on the coast at the moment. There's something called the Griffin's isopod, which when it's grown is about two centimeters big. And it latches on to the mud shrimp gill. And it grows on that gill by taking the blood, the, the, uh, the blood out of the, um, the shrimp and using it for its nutrient supply. Um, so you have this blood sucking creature that grow, is growing on you and just imagine there you are, you're carrying this two and a half year old around on your hip and they're sucking your blood the whole time. Well, you don't reproduce real well. In fact, you don't reproduce at all. So the mud shrimp, which you think of, so what, it's mud shrimp. Well, mud shrimp actually filter 80% of the water in some of the estuaries in, um, it, around the world. And uh, they're very important as prey for both um, fish and for um, salmon species and for other species that, that use the estuaries. And they turn over the, the mud at the bottom. They're, they're just very active species in the whole ecosystem. And they are pretty much becoming sterile and non-producing. And these, these isopods, they make like 60,000 offspring. The, the offspring, and so there are a lot of them around, and they go also into the ocean and they grow on another fish out in the ocean until they get to a certain point, and then they come back into the estuaries again and they get back onto the mud shrimp. So the isopod just kind of moves um, back and forth between those two environments. Um, so there, there's a lot of concern in the coastal estuaries all the way from Washington, all the way from British Columbia, um, down into Northern California. Um, the other thing is knotweed, which I don't know if any of y'all have that in your yards. I just happen to have some in mine, but it's, um, it's amazingly aggressive. It will come up through asphalt. It is a 10 foot tall plant with a, little, a lovely little flower on the top. And any little bit of it that comes off the root, even a half an inch that moves downstream, will find a place and grow another plant. So it's, it's uh, and it also sends snakes underground, it sends these little guys, these little tendrils, and it makes a new plant over here and over there. Well, it's taken over a lot of the north coast pasture lands. Um, it's taken over um, estuarial places, and so it's, it's been a very significant, um, impactful um, ornamental that was brought to the United States on purpose and is now kind of um, a little more active than we would wish. The ways that they get into the um, environment um, are ballast from ships. And the ballast water, I, I don't know if you, you know about that, but it's to make this, the ship stable when you're um, taking off cargo and putting on cargo. You have to make the weight um, about the same, and so you have to add water into your ballast holds in order to make that change. Well, if you pick up your cargo in, um, in Japan, and you come to this country, you're supposed to, in the mid-ocean, before you get into our territorial water, take this estuarial usual water, for your ports are usually kind of estuarial, and you're supposed to pump it out and pump in ocean water. And that takes out about 95% of the ballast water and puts it with salt water, which is supposed to kill off many of the organisms that would be dependent on having a more uh, freshwater environment and a different ocean composition. Um, and then you can come to shore and when you're taking on this really heavy cargo, you can dump your water out into our waters, which is problematic. Um, so there, that's been a way that we have had many of the organisms that are, uh, including that griffin isopod, it's thought to have been brought in ballast water um, into our territorial waters that then of course impact our lands. Um, Oregon has, um, what you would call not a robust um, ballast water um, oversight. Uh, DEQ oversees it and they, with our great state funding, we had one whole person doing it from about 2009, uh, 2007 um, until last year. And he was also responsible for making up all of the new regulations and having all of the committee meetings and having, well, in 2009, he um, actually got on 3.9% of the vessels that entered Oregon water. 
in 2011, they voted in another half-time position, so they'll be able to go through about 12% uh, of the arrivals. And they choose those 12% by previous people who have broken the law before. Um, if they're coming from a particularly problematic area, they might be more likely to, they, they have some things that sort of help them trigger who they need, which boats they need to get onto. But it's a very, it's a, you know, a slender portion. That's a 12% of all the boats that come in and, and uh, come to our waters are, are looked at closely. And um, as we mentioned before, we've never signed on to the International Maritime Organization's um, convention. Um, it is, in Oregon, it's, um, it's state law, it's treaties, it's federal laws, and, uh, and then best management practices also guide some of the principles of that, of that agency. Forestry. Um, I don't know if any of you were paying attention. I probably wouldn't have if I wasn't doing this study. Um, but there was a recent decision in Oregon about uh, protecting uh, the streams and waterways from the impacts of forestry. And there were actually a couple of lawsuits that went, went through the courts that helped to uh, promote that as a, as a, a point of interest. And um, part of what happened was that in 2009, uh, the Northwest Environmental Advocates, which are an environmental advocacy group, group from uh, Lewis and Clark, brought a suit um, against NOAA and the EPA, it's kind of convoluted the way suits are all the time, but they, they actually sued NOAA and the Environmental Protection Agency Federal because they were giving us money. They were giving us money even though we were not complying with the, the Clean Water Act requirements for the coastal area. And it just year after year, we kept on saying we would get a plan that would get in action and we would actually comply with this. And we just never got around to it. And so, I mean, I mean it's hard. You know, you have to have enough personnel and, and enough good planning. But they, they actually brought a suit that made them agree, made everybody agree that they had to change the way things were being done. So um, DEQ responded to that by um, saying that they would identify specific non-point sources of pollution, uh, including logging, in what are called the total maximum daily loads. It's the amount of pollution that's allowed to go into any waterway. Um, and they would identify the logging practices that were necessary to meet that allocation, to say that we're gonna keep our pollutions down to this level, and this is what we're gonna do to do it. So they actually had to define what their actions would be. Um, and these allocations, they actually are trying to involve all of the stakeholders in developing those, those plans because they have to agree, they have to, I mean, they have to be able to have a plan to say, yes, we can do it this way or we can do it that way and, and get down into the more acceptable levels of particularly sedimentation with the, with the logging industry. It's not so much pollutants in a, a chemical sense, it's pollutants in the sense of sediment in the streams. They're supposed to develop the mid-coast TMDLs uh, were supposed to be actually put into effect in June 30th of this year. I noticed on their website when I looked it up for the talk that they put it off until next year's June. So it's a long process. And on to dredging. Um, dredging is basic, basically excavation of stuff from under salt or fresh water. Um, it's used to widen shipping canals and to make them deeper. It's uh, used to change the flow of a, a stream. Um, it's used to harvest crustaceans, uh, so you can sort of dig stuff up. It's, uh, they use it to pick, pick sand up from one place and move it onto beaches when they're, it, not so much in Oregon, but in other parts of the world where they, they try to rebuild beaches after they've been washed away. Um, they use it to harvest, um, in our state particularly, gravel and sand um, and to extract minerals and to put in underwater tables, uh, cables and to build bridges and also to develop waterfronts with deep enough ports to, to use the ports. So it's really important in the maintenance of um, the ports. Not surprisingly, there are issues that have to do with environmental impact of dredging. Um, and it does change the, the way that the water flows when you are um, changing the deepness of a channel or doing something to the sides of the stream. Um, and it, it, changes, it changes the way the water flows through there and it changes the environment that various organisms have been dependent on. Um, 
One of the important things is that um, in the coast, there's a lot of interest in in, in getting gravels from the, the rivers themselves in order to use them for construction. Um, there's always a debate about whether they need to get it from rivers or can they just get it from other places that are not water dependent. But the, um, they do want to get it from a coastal area because to, using your gravel, it's very important that you take that your transportation distance is not so long. Gravel is pretty heavy to carry. When you start having to pay for the, the gasoline in your large trucks that are carrying your gravel, you want it to be as close as possible to where you're going to be building that road or repairing that road. Um, so when they are doing in-stream uh, gravel dredging, and in-stream refers to, um, it doesn't mean that they're in the water necessarily. They often wait until it is in the latter part of the summer when the water level is really low. The stream will be going by, but the part they're taking from is a bar that has been uh, exposed as the water lowered. And they, um, they go onto that bar and they, they make some sort of bridging device so that they can go in and take the gravel off of the bar. And they require, these days, they almost always require that the, the part that the water from the stream hits, that that top part of the bar is um, protected, that they not take the, any of the gravel from there, thinking that then the water won't be just rushing through this new deep area and washing away the whole bar, and hoping that that will then allow the stream to deposit more gravel in that same location as, as the next year goes through. Um, so um, one of the important developments that happened in the last couple of years is they've started doing um, something called the regional general permit for the gravel industry. And so they got all of the federal and state and tribal and blah, 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 all those agencies together, the ones that actually make rules about how you can do dredging with the, um, the concrete industry, the cement industry. And they, um, they developed these, they're trying to develop plans that will apply not just to one river, but to multiple rivers along the same coastal area. So they can just have one plan that they can hook into and not have to get their permissions from each of those agencies um, each time they go through this process. And we all hear all the time about how permitting is so complicated and takes so long and requires so much time and energy. So this is an effort to kind of streamline that. Well, from the environmental perspective, people are not terribly comfortable with that because they feel that the dynamics of streams are very different from one place to the other. So there's been this conflict, particularly around the Chetco area, the, the lower Chetco has been very much in play with, um, with, with people having a lot of uh, public input and environmental agency input into this. And um, that was uh, there, a whole lot of stuff going on. And they finally decided, actually, that they were going to allow the Chetco River to be mined for gravel this last year. And that, that was after how they did a geological survey of the Chetco to talk about stream dynamics and what, how did you build your gravel up again. It's an area that is really important for salmon. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I should say that it used to be really important for salmon. All 15 of them now really are not as important a <laughs> recreational but, uh, thing. But they're, they're, um, there is, you know, they're, they're protected species. They're, it, the hope is that they will then re, re, um, go back up those, those rivers and into the streams and reproduce more fully. And the concern is that if you change that environment at the beginning of the, in the estuarial area of that Chetco River, that you're going to really not allow them to uh, recover. Suction gold mining is another issue in those streams, particularly the Umpqua and the Rogue. Um, it is, it takes place in really remote sites, typically up in the, up in the feeder streams of, of larger rivers. And um, the way it's done is that you bring your sort of your pontoon um, uh, motor out there and it does a suction of the gravel from the bottom of the stream that then you run over a sluice to get the gold out of it. Well, of course, suctioning up a big part of uh, a creek makes a big impact, particularly on that area, but also downstream where when, when you're sending that, that muddy water over the sluice, all of the sediment goes downstream and it interferes with the, the life that's downstream. Um, so it's, been, it's always controversial. The other thing is that mercury was used in the old time mines. Well, the, 
the to get to get the gold out of the out of the gravel and um, they weren't particularly careful back at the turn of the century about what happened to the mercury. So mercury is, those are very popular sites. The old mining sites are the popular ones because they've been shown to have gold in them. And so there's resuspension of some of that mercury material uh, when they do that. And so far that hasn't been a big discussion outside of, you know, sort of smaller environmental communities. But it, all of that dredging stuff up changes the ability of, of wildlife to grow in that area. Um, and then the, when you come down to the stream with all of your equipment, you also destroy trees and you make it so that that is a packed piece of land instead of being a flourishing piece of land. So once again, another exciting controversy on the coast. Non-point source pollution um, is a... Um, is the part which you probably are aware. It's not the part that comes out of a, a tube or a um, channel or a pipe. It's, uh, it's the stuff that we do every day in our communities. We wash our cars, we uh, put insecticide on our lawns, we, we do things that uh, are then washed into our waterways as, um, as storm water. And um, it, is, it, it is just one of those places that's hard to control because you don't have a pipe. You can say, look, hey, you know, Mr. Um, chemical Producer, you, you got to change the way you're dumping this stuff into our stream. It's really, it's all of us. It's all of our activities that have to do with construction, um, um, road construction. It ha you know, there, it's around us every day, and it's a little bit harder to get a bead on it and get the be behavior to change because people don't perceive themselves as having an impact on the waterways. Um, Let's see, it's managed by, um, on the coast, it's managed in that region that we talked about a little bit when we talked about the beginning map where the coastal zone kind of comes from north to south down the coast and it's a pretty narrow strip, but then it also in the coastal non-pollution control program goes all the way back into the full range of the uh, Rogue and the Umpqua rivers and so it, ha it takes on a lot more of the state. Um, we talked a little bit before about the, the TMDLs that are being prepared for the state, for the coastal region that have to be implementation ready. Um, and it, their impacts from all, you know, all of the industries at the coast, the forestry, the mining, the dredging, the agriculture, on the waters that then end up in the coastal region. One of the repeated ones that recurrent that <laughs> is always an issue is the septic system failure. Uh, septic systems are used in 30% of residences and buildings in Oregon State. Um, and the EPA estimates that 10 to 20% of them fail every year. Um, in the past, DEQ has not have a, had a specific requirement for minimum standards of taking a look at your septic system and determining that it's actually working appropriately. Um, there were uh, sort of guidelines, but it wasn't enforced in any way. And as we know, if you don't enforce something, nobody spends the money to do it. So um, one of the things that happened uh, with the EPA, um, there was a requirement then that the Federal Coastal Management Act requires that there's an inspection system in place for septic systems at the coast. So in that coastal pollution control program, the ones that goes out into Umpqua and into the Rogue River, um, they have to have, the, the proposal is to do, and what is being enacted is to actually examine septic sy systems when there's a transfer of the property, when you sell or transfer your property. Um, pretty minimal if you're gonna be living there for 50 years, but important in having something in, in place to allow for inspection. Um, trash, we all know, solve. So everybody goes to the beach and picks up trash for a couple of days a year, and I notice that they're actually doing more of those now. They're actually increasing that. And of course, trash has been very important and interesting with the, with the tsunami effects. Um, what we're expecting to come onto the beaches is even more intriguing than, you know, the sinks and so forth that have been washed up on our shores before. Um, one of the big issues in trash is microparticles. Um, the microparticles are the stuff that's about half of a centimeter in size, and nobody picks those up. They're plastic. They float in the ocean, and in the ocean, they absorb many of the toxic chemicals from the ocean. 
And so you end up with this little particle that a fish thinks is food that it eats, and then as that fish is eaten by another fish, you get this accumulation um, of these plastic particles in the fish and also the, the toxic pollutants that are on those particles. So we don't really know what impact it's having in any kind of, with the people who are studying that right now, but it's, I don't know if you've walked on the beach and paid attention. After I read this, I went to the beach and you know, looked at this little section. It was like little teeny bits of plastic everywhere. Um, and it's a very, it, it's also floating around the ocean is the other part of that. Um, and then noise pollution is um, ever increasing in the ocean and we're really concerned about the ability of fish to navigate with all of the noises coming from um, their seismic surveys for gas and oil. Uh, commercial fishing, uh, military sonar, um, and are we out of time. <laughs> and um, there's a concern about whether f the animals can communicate with each other, whether they can sense prey, whether they can um, the mother calf um, communication, whether that's happening, and um, that's also an area of expanding research. And then climate change. Um, just two of the facts that I think are real interesting about that. Um, since 1920, uh, the air temperature in the Pacific Northwest has gone up at one and a half degrees Fahrenheit average. Um, and that's, that's pretty significant. The water temperature has also gone up. Um, it is anticipated um, that the snowpack in the Cascades will really respond to the air temperatures because it's expected to go up another 3.2 degrees by 2040. And the impact of that is that the, the snowpack in the mountains is going to melt, so you're going to have increased flow down the rivers and, and lack of flow towards the end of summer, of course, because everything is going to have been heated up and gone away. Wave height, besides sea level rise, wave height has gone up um, almost four inches every year since the mid-70s. So you have this accumulation of wave heights that are just becoming increasingly dramatic, and they run farther up on the beach um, because there's just more, this higher wave that's coming farther up. Um, so there's concern about the impact of that with um, storm surges and increased erosion on the beaches. Um, it affects state parks, it affects many of the ways, the areas in the coast that we like to explore around and hike in um, because they'll be flooding and there'll be flooding of, of Highway 101 as well. There's already flooding, of course, and it will be happening more as the sea level increases and as the wave heights increase and as we get more run up and it'll just be more of a um, um, dramatic impact on the land. Um, there's also movement of habitat, so you have some animals that were doing well at this temperature find it's too hot and they're going to move north uh, if they can. If they can't, they won't survive the change in temperature. They won't just, you know, the streams get too hot, the fish can't reproduce, they can't even respire effectively. They can't, they can't, they don't breathe. They can't exchange oxygen effectively. Um, and then there'll be increased salinity in the estuaries and in the, in the, the, the streams because the salinity will move as the water moves up, it'll increase the, the areas of salt water. So um, public planning, um, they, um, the same process that happened, the, the Department of Land Conservation Development, which is sort of the land use planning department in our state, uh, which is now developing this territorial sea plan that sort of maps out the whole ocean, the coastal ocean area, is, um, I mean, they, again, they've had, they've had meetings up the coast and down the coast and up the coast and inland a couple of places and then up and down again as the next phase comes. And they really have, I've watched that process real closely and I've been really impressed with the amount of uh, commitment they've had to having people participate and actually help to make decisions about where they can decide what the features should be in an area that you put a wave energy device, which is what they're working on right now. So it's, it's important that it's built into our uh, state planning goals because that helps to protect the public input for that. Um, and many challenges in the natural resource um, environment of the coast. Um, got to include both the ecological and the economic factors. Anybody have any questions? And this is the site where, you know, if you use these words exactly on your, 
um, on your search line, that will bring up where the study is located at the Legal and Voters um, website. Um, and under the education, under the studies, under the recent studies, and it's like, you know, you have to kind of work your way down a whole pathway, but this gets you right there. Any questions? Probably. Are you asleep yet? Yeah. <laughs> so. Do you have a question? Well, um, I, I think this is a very well done study. I think it's much needed. One of the uh, things that um, that I suppose surprised me most in here was is the process of um, uh, un oh I have a word for just unintended consequences and like some of the wave programs and the you know electricity producing proposals and things like that. Um, it, or maybe these things could sound really good on the surface until you factor in <laughs> and that's, that's the goal of having sort of pilot projects so that you can put one in the water and see what happens when you do that and, and doing it so that you're doing it, um, implement, implementing it slowly and, and getting some impacts back and getting to, you know, being able to monitor how you're doing. And of course, as you add more of them, the impacts will change, but you're also going to be monitoring how that happens. And unfortunately or unfortunately, nobody has enough money to make four million of these and stick them in the ocean right now. I mean, they're, they're just very, very, very expensive to produce. So they produce them as quickly as they can. And you know, they're often a whole year behind schedule. And when you get the second one in, I bet we're going to be another, uh, another year at least before they get the third one in. So it's, it's just a process that's a monitoring process. It sounds like it could be stripped from public use of beaches. That is one of the goals of the whole planning thing is to watch it, you know, what, that working group is really looking at um, where they're to be sited compared to not, not so much the, the use of the beach because it'll be offshore, um, I mean not offshore, offshore, but in the near shore and this, right in what we have any kind of say over is the three mile limit. Um, and it will come by a cable onto, um, you won't even notice much difference probably because it'll be a cable that comes through and then hooks up to an existing station. So not to, not to play that down because it will have impact on visual stuff unless people are extremely vigilant. Well, all of those communities up and down the coast are raising cane if they're gonna put something big and ugly in the middle of Cannon Beach, you know, duh. Um, they're, they're really paying very close attention to that part. And that's been that whole process. I mean, it's just been a strongly advocated by Surfrider, by you know, the Audubon Society, by you know, all of those different agencies and the public have weighed in very heavily. What a great presentation. Oh, she's fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And one more comment. I'm too long. Several years ago, the League of Women Voters of Louisiana did uh, a big statewide study on the importance of uh, estuaries yeah and mm -hmm. and it the things that they predicted that would happen because of all the changes that were made with with the oil development and and uh, different commercial things proved to be true yeah. when uh, Katrina mm -hmm. came because apparently had that some of that not taken place the estuaries would have been able to absorb much of that exactly. damage that yes. was yeah. done yeah. Or, or mitigated, I yes. should say. Something. Yeah, it's, it's really, you never want to be right about that stuff, but it's kind of horrifying. Yeah. How are the watershed councils working with all of these various agencies? Because it seems to me that it's the watershed councils that have the local mm -hmm. public connection and input? Um, you know, I don't, I'm trying to remember what, at those meetings, what that is. It's really like any voice in the community that wants to have a voice in that goes to those meetings. And they try to put them at different times of the day. They try to put them close together so you have a noon one here and a seven o'clock one there. So that, you know, anybody from any of the community agencies or any of the, of the um, what's that called when you have your city council? Uh, the, the um, the local community elected people come in to testify as well. So there's there's been a whole lot of input. 
The Soil and Water Conservation Districts work very closely with the watershed councils, and, and the two of them, between them, a lot of the restoration work is, is a com combination of the efforts of these two, because they, the, the alternate ones can raise money in different ways, and so they work very closely on that. So they're, they're tremendously involved. And uh, when we talked to the Soil and Water Conservation District, and they talked about, and they, and they were in particular the one that, that was in Lincoln County, was particularly concerned with not we which was uh, problematic upstream and, and causing a lot of problems and they had been working and they had you know shared agreements on that and and are doing that and the soil and water and, and the watershed councils are, are very keen on that the um, Tillamook uh, area where they've had a lot of problems and they had a lot of different impairments up there the watershed councils have been leaders in, in uh, doing the work on all of the kind of uh, impaired waters and how to fix it and to do the other things so so their involvement is tremendous but you know, this is a small, uh, a narrowly populated thing. So it, the challenge is coming because there are not a lot of people to do a lot, and, and that becomes their challenge. But they are hardworking groups, and, and they work together. And, and the one in Tillamook, and I think you, if you read in the study, there's an example of what's going on in Tillamook and some of the things that they've done. And you can even go further, and you can uh, you on know, their website on their website yeah. and find out more about it. But that's a particular area where the watershed councils have been uh, leaders in the front end of that. And Tillamook is odd because it has a whole convergence of rivers. So, and then this huge floodplain for the coast. I mean, it would be a huge floodplain on the east coast, but on our coast it's a huge floodplain, and, and they have been working very hard to restore their floodplain and do things, and including moving buildings and uh, lifting buildings and doing a whole bunch of things. I want to thank the state for all the hard work they did on the study. It's going to be a lot for us to absorb and to discuss and to come to consensus in two weeks uh, for our second, for our fourth Tuesday meeting at the m, m restaurant. We will be doing a consensus on the uh, Oregon Coast study. Thank you very much. <laughs>